All right, good morning. This is another episode of Tie-Dye Dialogues, a show where we are digging deeper into the leadership skills of some of our Valley leaders. And um, this morning we have a real special treat because um, our guest this morning is Ravine Aurora um, of Tempe and, and early in his life from India, and Ravine will give us the, all of that story. I've been fortunate to meet Ravine as a member of the board of directors of Tempe Community Action Agency, and have just learned uh, really over the last year or so of Ravine's incredible accomplishments and his leadership. Um, I'm gonna share a screen real quickly, and then Ravine, I'll, I'll let you chat with us, but. Um, I want to share uh, the story that was in the um, Republic not long ago. Can you see that, Ravine? Yes, I do. So Ravine has been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize for his work with the Tempe community, Tempe's Indian community. I would invite anybody to go to the June 27, 2021 um, Republic to read this article. So Ravine, um, Good morning. Thanks for joining me this morning. I morning, you. I'm truly humbled. I'm truly humbled. I mean, this, uh, all I can say is, you know, I'm just an ordinary human being. I'm human. Nothing human is alien to me. And um, if through the miracles of the internet, I could reach through and I could see if you bleed or not, I would, but I don't have the ability to do that. So. Are you at your home office right now, by the way? Oh, uh, yes. So I yes. see uh, Mother Teresa behind you there. Um, tell us a little bit why Mother Teresa is on your shelf behind us there. Um, that is an honor I received in Calcutta in 2017. Um, very humbly accepted the Mother Teresa International Service Award because my work with Mother Teresa started when I was six or seven years old in Calcutta. We, we, my parents were refugees and I'm a refugee child. So she was Sister Teresa in those days and she was doing community work. And she came to our school in the class and I was mesmerized by what she told and what she said. And I'll share a story with you. Uh, but this has a prominent place in my life because all my life I've shaped as what I learned is about humility, kindness, empathy, compassion, what people call it the buzzwords today, but these are really hum uh, humanity 101. I learned how, hum how important it was to be humble, how important it was to be kind, and how important it was to be selfless. Uh, this award uh, was the 18th International Service Award. What is truly humbling is the prior recipients were mostly heads of states, very, very important global icons who had received this. And for me to be selected like this and invited to Calcutta and to receive this was beyond my wildest dreams. So Mother Teresa, uh, now Saint Teresa. I mean, I remember a story uh, that I was in class grade uh, three, I think. I was about eight years old. And we used to walk to school. We used to walk to school because my parents couldn't afford a bus, uh, a bus for me. Uh, so she comes to our class one day and the father rector who we called because it was a Jesuit school. Um, he brings Sister Teresa there and she says, well, I do this, I do that, but I'm here to see a few kids. And there are lots of wealthy kids there too. It was a mix. Uh, could you give me one rupee, which was like one cent today, one penny, and there were about 42 of us or 41 of us in class. So each one of us reached in our pocket and they took out 
somebody took out. If in India, the dollar is called a rupee. So that's a local currency. Or, you know, cents are called annals, whatever it is. So I put my hand in too, but my hand never came up. My hand never came up. And she noticed that. She took me aside and she says, uh, little ravine, um, I have 40 of them here, but I didn't see you contribute. Did you contribute? I was sheepish and I said, sister, um, no. I was putting myself behind and she says, but why? But I saw your hand in the pocket. I said, I was just following what others were doing and stopping them. And I wanted to, he says, but why did you put your hand in the pocket? Did you want to give? I said, sister, honestly, yes. But my parents don't have it. I don't have it. I walk from school. I walk from home, three miles. I come to class. And she looked at me intently. And then after three minutes or two minutes, after she talked to the others, she took me aside. And she said, little Ravine, can you come to the front of the class? And I froze and I thought, and the teacher who we called father was there. And I thought, you know what? She's gonna say I didn't give, and that's worse. Uh, she says, you know what? All of you gave, but this boy. But honestly, this is the boy I want you to emulate in life. He wanted to give. He didn't have to give. He wanted to give. So that became my mantra. That became my mantra, that you must want to give, not have to give. That want has to come from inside. Do you want to do something for somebody? Do you want to be involved? Lou, you and me are working in TCAA. You are a very busy attorney, you don't have to do this. You take time out to come to meetings, take on responsibility, because you want to give that back to the community. We pay it forward, kind of, because what we do for ourselves perishes with us. We know, don't take nothing. Neither are you gonna take your practice with you or your swank office, or am I going to take all these honors and awards and mementos of my life's milestones or mile markers, as I call them? Nothing with me. Right. But what we will take is what we did for others. That's our legacy. Did we try to do something different? Did we try to give our time? Normally, when I meet people, Lou, they tell me, oh, I don't have time for this. You know, I'm so busy. I'm so busy. I am are uh, immersed in my business, in my pursuit, in my family, with my kids. I truly, truly, Ravine, I don't have time. I wish I could, but you know what? At the end of their monologue, I tell them, hey, time is all you have. That's the only thing we have in life is time. Right. And we always yeah. have one choice, I one chance, <clears throat> and that's there's a, um, there's a little saying that I like in spending time with people. You and I are spending time together right now. Is that the greatest gift that you could give another person is your time. Because um, <clears throat> as you just said, that's all you have. <laughs> and so spending, whether it's 30 minutes, like we're going to do, or four or five hours on a golf course, you're giving a gift of your time and you're receiving a gift of the other person's time, which is a real valuable gift, so. That is what defines, that's the essence of life. Yeah. Because that's part of our life that we give to each other. Right. That's part of our life think, that we won't get back. We can't get back this time. And I think that just to follow up on your comment, and I'm not the one being interviewed here, but is that people who say, I don't have time for this, are forgetting the point. And the point is that, you know, it's your gift of time to other people that is really the priceless gift that you have to give. So um, let me ask, you know, a lot of people here in Tempe know you from the Daba 
restaurant. Can you tell us a little bit about the Daba story? Uh, how you got into the restaurant business and what, what's an going on with the Daba? I'm an accidental tourist. I'm an accidental tourist. Uh, my background is more white collar crime specialist. My books and all in the 70s, they're all about white collar crime, internal controls, auditors, audit controls, and maritime frauds. So I came to US in 1981 to pursue my PhD, which I didn't end up because I got into the consultants part of it. And the challenge started uh, with a simple thing like tea. Like we have iced tea. And in those days, uh, coffee was the big beverage. Tea wasn't happening. So I started introducing tea in the US because tea was the world's biggest well, beverage because it's the only cup that cheers the world because in the UK, China, India. So I felt this was a great challenge. I could bring the values of India and you know, define, bring India closer. So it started with teas. And then in 2000, my daughter wanted to do her supply chain major and she only wanted to do in Phoenix, in ASU because it was one of the best programs. And my son, who was a couple of years younger, he was working with Honeywell. And he says, Dad, if my sister is going, I want to do my MBA from Thunderbird and no other school. Uh, as an avid golfer in the olden days, I played because even as a refugee child, I mean, Calcutta, which was the second um, most important city outside in the British Empire, outside of London, at one of the oldest golf courses and we could play because in the neighborhood, whether it was an iron or a stick, our hockey sticks, the field hockey sticks looked like that. So we started hitting. So we developed, you know, some sort of skills you get because when you are poor, dirt poor, you don't play tennis, you don't go on the golf course, but you have a stick that costs like $2 and you start practicing your swing because that's similar to the field hockey. Uh, so long story short, I said, okay, my back has been ailing for a while and let's go to Phoenix. Let's go to Phoenix, let's go to Arizona. So we close it to our kids. I mean, all right, and I will just do what I can. Driving to ASU, I saw this very blighted highly challenged, prostitute-driven, drug-driven uh, corridor called Apache Boulevard between McClintock and Price. Yeah, I mean, it was one of the busiest highways earlier, the thoroughfares. Mm -hmm. uh, but something told me about this building. I said, you know what? This is what I would like to do. And People said, well, you've not done any of this. Why are you doing and investing your hard-earned life savings into a stretch that won't last you? I remember Tombstone, because that was what was told to Ed Shuffler. You'll be digging your own tomb here. You'll die here, and you won't find silver in Tombstone. But he did strike, and he found the biggest stake, claim that he filed. So I said, you know what? I've lived in the slums of Calcutta. I've worked hard. I've grown up in her city, worked with Mother Teresa, I met Dr. King. So what is this going to be? Let me bring India closer to the US, to Arizona. So I said, I will build an India center here. An India center, and people said, India center? Nobody cares about India. I said, well, if you look, one out of six doctors are Indians. All this technology that we are bringing in outsourcing is coming from India. And all of a sudden, there's a crave for yoga, and there's a craze for alternate medicine and spices. So I started that business mind in me, started thinking. And I said, you know what? Let me invest in this, and we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Long story short, uh, 20 years from uh, later, 
It's a destination with an economic impact of $50 million to Kenti over the years. And the Daba was a classroom project for my son in his, for his MBA. And he wanted to, he was challenged by one of the deans. I don't know if it was Mr. Steve Forbes or whoever was teaching them classes. It says, nobody has built a project ground up. So he just raises his hand and says, I'll do it, I'll do it. So what would you like to do? He says, well, I don't know, but maybe a restaurant. And then he comes to me and we say, why a restaurant? He says, dad, that's where we'll bring people together. At the end of the day, everybody wants good meal, good together. I said, good idea, son, but it's uh, got the highest mortality. 97% restaurants fail and on it. And what are you gonna do? He says, no, we'll go to Scottsdale. I said, no, if you wanna do, let's build it in India Plaza on Apache Boulevard. He says, but dad, nobody wants to come to India Plaza or Apache Boulevard to eat a fine meal. I said, go back to the roots. What did we do? India was divided based on religion. In 1947, um, politics and religion combined together to carve out the present day India and the Pakistan. I said, that is where Alexander met his Waterloo. Alexander the Great, I gave him some good prep talk. I said, Alexander couldn't come. Columbus wanted to go to India to get spices. So he made the wrong turn, he found us, let's say. And I said, let's build a small restaurant with a name that everybody knows. I said, India is gaining prominence. India is achieving, becoming a strategic ally, strategic partner. Let's call it the Daba. Daba means a truck stop, synonymous with fresh food. If you go, India is dotted with highways, the Daba, and they serve the best food. I said, let's do an authentic food. He says, no, I'll call it a fusion food. We'll call it Indian food. I said, no, everybody calls Indian food. How about calling it Punjabi food? He says, but dad, but we don't speak Punjabi at home. I said, but we are, our ancestors are from there. And that was the cradle of human civilization. That's the story. Even Mark Twain said, India was the cradle of human civilization. So was Punjab, which is present day Pakistan part of it. And I said, we do that. And through that, we evolved authentic, fresh, home style recipes, and Lou, 10 years later, it had one of the biggest openings because Thunderbird put its mic behind it in marketing. It was amongst the highest grossing uh, per square foot restaurants in the country. Zagat rated it as extraordinary to perfection. 74% of the clients drive 30 miles to come to that little hole in the wall, Apache <laughs> because we do things differently. It wasn't about profits, it was about purpose. It was about embracing a community. It was about stakeholders, that were my employees, the people who worked around us, the uh, resident population. And in 20 years, we've never had one incident that we had to call the cops. We've never had a break-in, we never had a, a, uh, a theft, We've never had any issues in the center. And that's where now TCAA proudly houses the Oasis. Right. right. That's how the Daba is interwoven into the community. <laughs> and um, I take pride in founding it, but I don't take pride in the success of it because mine was, I just worked there. So I want to um, try to cover like I said, as much as we can in a short period of time. So in the, in the research that I did, which there's a lot of information about you on the internet, whether, whether you like it or not. So here's some of the people who you've met and I want, I want you to tell us who is in your mind, who comes to your mind is like the most memorable. We've already talked about Mother Teresa, Dr. Martin Luther King, the Dalai Lama, Muhammad Ali, President Carter, Nelson Mandela and the Pope. Well, I don't know how much higher we can go, but so who, who I'm, just right I'm off the, the bat Gump. comes to your mind here? I'm the Forrest Gump, probably. I was just lucky. You have, um, a, box, you have a box of chocolates sitting there with uh, you? Do I, that's my life. I don't really <laughs> know what's in it. 
how it ends up. Well, uh, the Dalai Lama I met in several times, actually, several times. In fact, I was uh, partly responsible for the, uh, you know, the childhood lives in you. We built a small classroom for the people who could not afford to go to school because my life was in the slums. So I could see those little girls and boys who had no space. So we told Father Rector in our school if we can have a classroom so we could volunteer our time when we were in grade eight or nine, trying to teach them basic skills, the three R's as we call it. And it had Mother Teresa's uh, blessings. It had the Dalai Lama's blessings. He was in Calcutta because there's, there he is in exile. Calcutta had a lot of Tibetans. And I had worked with the Tibetan refugees in 1962. So that opened up my doors to the Dalai Lama. And he blessed that opening. And after that, I've been in touch. And yesterday, somebody asked me, what would be my favorite book? And all I could say is, and I'll get it, is the Dalai Lama's uh, It's in my, on my sofa right here. The Art of Forgiveness. The Art of Forgiveness. Mm. And I have stayed in touch with his office and I met him. Dr. King I met when I was all of 11 years old. That was his maiden and only trip to India. He was a devout follower for nonviolence with uh, Gandhi. He never met Gandhi, but he went to Calcutta uh, in 1959. And my grandfather was a barrister because a lot of focus was put on education in us. So I come from school and he says, we need to go and see some, somebody. There is a, a pastor coming from uh, the US. And I thought, you know, we'll go and play soccer or what we call football and whatever. And there, um, it takes me to a thing called U United States Information Services. That was like a foreign uh, US offices or cultural centers. It's called the USIS in India in 1950s. So a small hall auditorium. And there's a towering black gentleman with his wife and everybody's introduced in my little skinny hands. I also numbly shake. And uh, he says, I'm Martin, and uh, the wife Coretta was there. Uh, in the end, I was the only kid there, so we spent about 15, 20 minutes chatting. And he talked about negative equality, he talked about voting, and that made such an impact on me. I never got to see him again, but 60 years later, I had spent a whole day with his daughter, Bernice, in Atlanta, and she gave me, she personally signed a few books for me. She gave me a father's memoirs that were being published in Stanford. And I presented her that one newspaper that I had kept with me. And we were both in tears. I gave her the original newspaper that I had tucked away from time 11. And this is a photocopy of that particular newspaper in Calcutta called The Statesman, uh, February 17, 1959. It had a tremendous impact on me. Tremendous impact on me. It says Gandhian pa pastor in Calcutta, hopeful trends towards integration in the US. So that showed me that all, he came to see Gandhi and later on I learned that what it was all about is about yeah. diversity, about inclusion, it's about uh, true diversity, uh, like uniting through our differences, not despite our differences. So I started with a good combination, Mother Teresa, the Dalai Lama, uh, Dr. King, all these and eventually became Nobel laureates. Okay. And so, then uh, I met, I've met the queen. I have met uh, Dr. Mandela, after him, I mean, Nelson Mandela, Bishop Tutu. Uh, and I was honored 
at the Vatican by Pope John Paul II. And that's something very close to me uh, because it just showed that how just somebody who's a nobody can still, I know what my self-worth is. I know who I am. I know what I stand for. And uh, this and many others, including uh, Nobel laureate, former President Carter, all I learned was one thing they had in common was humility. What everybody was humble and everybody did this. Everybody folded their hands. And this- Could you show us what, I can't see what you're doing on screen there. Could you show us? Folding the hands means- Like, like this, you mean? Yes. Okay. Like this is called, in India, it's called Namaste. We go to a church, we go to a synagogue, we go anywhere. Mm -hmm. We go to a temple, we fold our hands because it, it's an old Indian way of greeting. The Japanese took it, the Thais took it, Asia has it. And now with the pandemic, we are not trying to bump it, even we are scared, okay? We are doing this, thank you, thank you, thank you. And this is because it says, it teaches us humility. It teaches us there is a God in you, there's a divinity in you. Every human being is blessed. They are all born the same way. We all cry the same way. We smile the same way, okay? We may not look the same, but we are the same. So this means the God in me bows before the God in you, is humbly put. And I learned that, like my father would say, a tree that has no fruit is bare and barren and tall, but a tree that has low hanging fruit will bend will bend. So when you succeed, don't be cocky and don't be looking up because you are going to fall. Be humble, look down. Mm. What he meant was don't forget your roots where you came from. Look down and when you climb, okay, going up is easy. Coming down is where the problem is. We go up, but when we are on the cliff, we are so afraid. We made the cliff, but the fear tripping from the cliff down into the abyss, into the deep valleys, that is the fear. That is why the same person who can climb the Everest but is afraid of falling down from the Everest because success is very fleeting. It's a very lonely, it's the loneliest feeling you will have is success. And I don't find myself successful at all because these awards, these honors don't mean anything to me, honestly, Lou. I'm still the same ravine who hasn't forgotten his childhood, who hasn't forgotten the long walks to school. I haven't forgotten my long walks to the ration shop where we would get one pound of bread and one pound of flour under the US PL 480 plan of US, uh, it was called US aid program in the 50s. And we were in denial the whole time. But today I realize after working with the hunger and the poor and the homeless and the hapless is that I wasn't getting food. The ration shops were dispensing poverty, basically. They were not dispensing meals because how do you feed a family of four or five with one pound of flour every week? And today Tempe is ravaged, Tempe Community Council Agency What's our biggest challenge? Is poverty, is homelessness, is haplessness, is senior abuse. And I went through all that. I empathize. Poverty was my best friend because poverty will lead to starvation. Starvation will lead to hunger. And what does hunger do? Makes us steal, makes us miss classes, makes us less educated, makes us less focused, makes us prone to more social ills. So that's where, you know, how I came into TCAA is that way. Then I see the homeless. I see those homeless people. They are not children of a lesser God. They're saints. 
They have also done, they're just simply down. Look at them. They have served our country, but they are forgotten. Now, because whatever happens, that's the price we are paying. I started a campaign called Hug a Homeless several years ago uh, under my Think Human global initiative because I felt that we talk about poor. It's like we're talking about diversity the whole time, Lou. It's the business of diversity that is good, but are we truly diverse? Have we shared our biases? Have we shared the illusion of inclusion? We have not. We have not. We are fragile human beings, still egocentric, still there. So I used to say that, that you know what? We like the smell of, we talk about the poor, but do we like the smell of the poor? We, do we like the smell of the poor? Hug a homeless, make him feel he is part of us. So what happened then is they came to protect me. They kept my business alive. They kept my business afloat. They would never rob from me. They would never steal from me. They would be part of that community. Once I saw somebody eating out of my dumpsters, I put up notices out there, big long notices. Please don't eat out of dumpsters. Come to the front, we'll give you a warm meal. Now that to me is a life's journey. That to me is fulfillment. That to me today, I'm blessed. You know? I don't have to look at the right side of a menu. I've traveled to 100 countries. I've flown the Concorde many times. I've been on the QA tools. I've sailed the world, circled the world, met heads of state. But where does it teach me? It taught me one thing, just one thing, humanity. Think human, think human. Because unless you can think human, you won't be human. And unless you are human, we cannot succeed. Anything we do in life will be very short-lived. Well, Ravine, I don't know how I could really follow up on that, your final little summation there. Um, I like to keep these um, chats to about 30 minutes and we're, we're right there. We could go on for the longest time. And I, in fact, I wouldn't mind if you would be willing to doing session number two soon and delve a little deeper. You're, you're one of the most inspirational people I've ever uh, chatted with, so. Um, would you be willing to do that so that uh, people can digest Lou, anytime, this? Anytime, anytime if we can make a difference. Okay. Thank you. If it touches somebody, like I said, time well, is all we have. And my time is yours. All right, well. I'm on board time now, I'm in my Q4, so. All right, well, it's very humbling even spending time with you, to be honest with you. So you're, uh, you're an inspirational person. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, we'll close out today. Uh, give people an opportunity to uh, get to know you through this. And then uh, we'll, we'll visit again soon, if that's okay. All Thanks, right. Man. And it is a, um, it's a pleasure, by the way, serving on the Tempe Community Action Agency board with you. You're very inspiring on that board as well. So I'm humbled and honored. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you again. And we'll uh, see you soon. Bye-bye. This has been another episode of Tie-Dye Dialogue.